Kirk Reed, musicians in bars getting beer. I am Kirk Reed from The Reed Effect, and we have a new album coming out, like a six song EP, and we're really excited about it. It's We put two and a half years into this thing, literally two and a half years, and we have our first single coming out in late October of uh, 2020. So we're really excited. We're gonna have a radio tracker. We're also gonna have a video, an animated video um, to our single Fine Here. So, um, yeah, so part of the, the process with uh, our producer, Ted Sabdalis, uh, was great. He really took the songs that we had and he could, took it to the next level. We, we even had to rewrite lyrics. We had to restructure really? songs and we didn't cut any corners. So we, it's a we, big part of the process. Absolutely. These songs wouldn't be... Hi, Ted. I'm proud... Yeah, hey, Ted. And uh, props to Ted for sure. Um, I'm very, very proud of what my contribution is and Chris's as well. Um, so we, we wrote the music, but they wouldn't be... Uh, to the level of what they are without Ted, for That's sure. That he well, needed, we needed that guidance. So uh, tell us more about the people that worked on that. Yeah, so we had uh, my brother Chris, of course, Chris Reed, the Reed Effect, uh, playing bass, and he did all the backup harmonies as well. He did a, an amazing job. Uh, we had Brian Fontes uh, play drums and all the percussion on, on the album. And Brian Last was uh, originally the, the singer of Last Bullet. Yeah. Uh, but even with Last He's your Bullet... Drummer? Yeah, he, he was our drummer at the time when, when he recorded the drums. And um, so Brian Fontes, he was originally uh, the drummer for Last Bullet, Bullet. A lot of people don't know that. Um, so he was the drummer at the beginning. And he's primarily a drummer. Like, he, he's, he's good. And so when he started playing drums with us, uh, he was still the singer of Last Bullet. So we, there, there was some crossover. He was in the two bands, drumming in one and uh, singing in the other. And uh, we even did a couple little mini tours um, double bill so the reed effect would open up and he played drums for the reed effect and then he would sing for last oh, bullet so yeah he was he was definitely a machine so he's uh, on the record so he's on the record he did the drums the percussion he's, he's not officially part of the band at the moment the okay. part of the band the, the core members of the band is just chris and myself at the moment and we're going to be using different drummers over the next year or so um when we play live again which isn't going to happen in the next few months anyway so <laughs> Um, so we also have um, Douglas Nolan. He's the keyboardist in my, my other band, the, the Muddy York Blues Machine. Uh, he's the, the organist keyboardist there. So he played a bunch of tracks, almost all of the songs. He played organ, he played the clavinet, he played the whirly. Um, and then <clears throat> my other good friend, uh, Gord, played um, organ as well on another track, which is a sermon, rant, motivational speech kind of thing, which I'll get into later. So that's the seventh okay. track. Yeah, it's killer. People, people are going to love it, especially in this day and age. Um, <clears throat> so we also had Veronica uh, come in and she sang backups on a few tracks. But Veronica McNamee, who's my uh, girlfriend right. and also the, the lead singer of the Muddy York Blues Machine, my right. other band. Um, so she sang some backups and she's saying, yeah, this hey, is Veronica. actually part two of that interview. Yeah, exactly. So she's, uh, so she's saying backup, but also lead. Uh, at the end of one song as well. And uh, there was also one song that uh, my friend Care, Failure, from uh, Die Mannequin, so she helped co-write one of the songs oh, cool. called Rise Up. Hi, Care. And, yeah, hey, Care. Interview. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so she helped write the melody on uh, one what's, of the songs. What's that song? It's called Rise Up. And it's going to be a single. Uh, we're not sure if we're going to release that second or third, uh, but it's definitely going to be a single. We're going to do a video for it. It's, it's rock. It's slamming, just like the first one. Right. Uh, so we're really, really appreciative, appreciative of her input um, on that track. And as far as music, and Ted played guitar in a couple of the songs as well because I, it was COVID time, and he wants to again, he wants to make sure each song is as strong as possible and reaches its highest potential, which it took two and a half years to do. It, it required a lot of building. It's not like a little tree fort; it's a mansion, you know. And it's not like an appetizer; it's like a five course meal. Like it has so many different whole bunch of ear candy throughout the whole album. So we're so excited to get this out. I'm going to push the hell out of it for the next year. Cool. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, you mentioned a bit about Veronica. And yeah. So, York, and uh, yeah. So Veronica, any direction you want, I guess. yeah. So <laughs> Veronica is the lead singer of second pass as well. And that's really where I met her. Cause I was the front guy of, uh, the Reed effect and she was the front woman in the second pass. Are you talking we three had, or four years ago. Yeah. We're talking like five, six years ago. So we started seeing each other about like over five years ago, but we didn't really, most people think that we play music together all the time. And we really didn't up until about a year and a half ago. Um, Veronica started a blues band called the Muddy York Blues Machine. 
And uh, she had an organist already. Then she asked me to play guitar, and I said, yeah, sure. Why didn't you ask me first, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know. So, but then I joined, then we built up, and then we've had a, a story there. Like, you know, our original organist was amazing, but that didn't quite work out. And then, uh, I don't want to go too much into this story, but a, a, good, a dear friend of mine, uh, Tyson Froze, uh, was the next keyboardist that, that joined. And unfortunately, we were just about to play a gig at Hughes Room, and I think we alluded to that in the previous interview, but he uh, passed away the week before um, our gig at Hughes Room. So, yeah, so that was, a, that was extremely sad and such a shock. Um, but then a couple months after that, we got Douglas Nolan to sit in. So from, for like the last year and a half, it's been, it's been the five member. Uh, blues band with Kevin Costa and with uh, Kevin Ellis as well and of course Ronica McN McNamee and uh, yours truly so uh, so yeah we have an album and again I sold I'm, I'm York so has an album? yeah the Muddy York has a six song EP coming out as well okay. uh, we finished the drums bass and guitar right before the pandemic so we had all the kind of the beds done and we're now we're doing the the organ now now that things are lightening up a little bit um, so we, we should have that out like later this year in 2020. So right. I'm, we're really excited about that. I was so happy with uh, the work that Ted Sedalos did with us. Uh, so I had to, with I sold, effect. yeah, with the read effect. And uh, I sold it on the band, the Muddy York. Um, so, so he's been producing us and it, it's sounding amazing. Um, so yeah, so there's uh, so I'm excited to release uh, two albums from my two original bands uh, later this year. First will be the Reed Effect. We're going to re be releasing a single uh, from that album called Fine Here. And it'll be on Canadian radio, and we're, uh, we're going to release a video as well, and yeah. an animated video. Yeah, tell us about uh, the video. Um, so the thing is, I wanted to do a video, like a live video with a bunch of people, but the pandemic hit. Right. We were originally supposed to release the whole album in May uh, of 2020 here, just last spring. And then, uh, so we had a gig May 1st at the Horseshoe, and then everything went to shit obviously the, the lockdown but in a way honestly like i know people are suffering in this we're having a lot of challenges these days but as far as the release of the album is concerned it was really a blessing for us downtime. for it to yeah we had some downtime we had our consultant so i can become more pro promotional savvy and um we also had more time for ted to really dive into the mixing process and take all these songs to the next level because he had nothing else to do right he, so he spent all his time and he's obsessed with like, you know, getting this album. He couldn't even sleep at night if there's something <laughs> else. So he just kept on combing through. That's great. And we're talking about like the snare in like the 30 second bar of the fourth song. You know, he's like, okay, <laughs> that, we got to tweak that. He's like down to the. That's great. Yeah. The devil's in the details. So he's just combed through, combed through. So it was, we're really, uh, you well, know, if the, the pandemic, yeah, if the pandemic, Ted's the man, if the pandemic um, was going to happen anyway, the timing for us was very uh, perfect. Um, so, tell, so, have you told us about everybody in that band and who, who's on those? The Reed Effects? Oh, yeah. I so, think you're on Muddy York now. Oh, the Muddy York. Uh, yeah, so Ted Sevdalis is pr producing the Muddy York Blues Machine. We have three originals, and we have three covers because we're a blues band, right? So you got to kind of pay homage to the, the greats. <clears throat> but we're going to do it in our way. Sorry, where were we? Because you went into the video a little bit. Oh, right. Sorry. Yeah, let's get back to the animated video. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just going to cut that. Okay, so, <laughs> right. Um, so we're going to be releasing our first single, The Read Effect. Um, you know, the first single is called Fine Here. We're going to get it on Canadian mainstream radio. It, it has legs. Uh, we're very confident in the song. Because originally we wanted to do a live video for the song because it's so rocking. So we wanted to get a bunch of people together, but we can't because of the lockdown. So I'm thinking, like, why not do an animated video, right? <clears throat> so I wrote the whole storyboard, I wrote the storyline, and then uh, got, we have an animator working on it. So, so we'll be releasing an animated video for Fine here, probably in late October, early November. Um, and it's going to be a story, it's really about a girl. It's going to be from a female per perspective. I have had so many female friends over the years telling me stories about these dickhead guys that they, be, they were dating and stuff. So we're going to have a female perspective uh, for the video. It's called Fine Here, but it's really Fine Here Without You. We're, I'm gonna be fine on my own, I, I don't need you, right? So that's what, I don't wanna to get too oh, much okay. into the details of the, the storyline of the video, okay. but it's gonna be very, very interesting, and it's gonna be a lot of fun. 
and I think a lot of uh, women and girls are going to be able to relate uh, relate to it. <clears throat> so we're going to release that right after we release it on radio too, right? And then we'll release another um, video early in 2021 called 1973. The name of the album is called 1973, uh, and it's really based on one song called 1973, <laughs> kind of paying homage to that era. <clears throat> we think it was a very special, we're not locked into classic rock. We're not, we're not stuck in that. We loved all kinds of songs and bands from uh, the grunge era, from the 90s. You know, we love uh, Stone Temple Pilots, Soundgarden, and then Foo Fighters, and then uh, Queens of the Stone Age, and some of the newer bands, <clears throat> the Rival Sons. Um, <clears throat> but the, we did pick one song to really pay homage to 1973 and more in particular the rock scene at that time. We feel that rock and roll was still very fresh. I mean rock and roll really started in the mid 50s with Elvis and you know Jerry Lee Lewis and all those guys, Little Richard. And then the Beatles kind of took it to the next level. But then like Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd, The Doors, Jimi Hendrix who uh, <clears throat> is his anniversary of his uh, death today. Um, it was a very special time. It was very fresh, and uh, the audience was so hungry for that kind of music, and I thought it was so beautiful. So we, we um, so I wrote a song about 1973, and so we have a video for that. So we'll release that in uh, early 2021. And our good friend JC Sandoval from the Crooked, you know JC. JC's been on the show. Uh, Hi, JC. Yeah, yeah. Uh, great. He was my roommate for many years. Great guy. And so he's doing, a, he did the video for 1973 and it's basically done, but he did a great job. Um, um, so yeah, so he's involved in that perspective. So we have all these things lined up for the next few months. We're going to be, it's gonna, we have like a year of content coming up. So let's go into your autobiography and uh, sure. talk about your influences. You mentioned a bit of the influences of, is that from the Reed Effect influences or the Muddy York influences? I, I would say both ultimately, but I, I'm, I am a very huge uh blues fan I love you know BB King uh, Steve Ray Vaughn from years ago um, <clears throat> Johnny Lang who I saw years ago too like I, I'm I've really like the main reason I play guitar I'll be honest is Jimmy Page that my my original you have a Gibson. yeah Gibson Les Paul <laughs> absolutely but I was also raised my uh, Chris and my dad is a minister and he really comes from the Pentecost of faith he kind of left that and became an Anglican minister. But the thing is, I, I went to many Pentecostal services as a, as a kid, I was, as I was growing up. And the music those guys play, man, it was just incredible. I was really, I don't know what I was moved by the spirit or by the music. I'm not sure, probably That's a combination great. of both, but it was incredible. So I think really my core, um, my earliest influences, I would say is that, is the music and the, the it was rocking and people would, uh, run all over the place. It's kind of like a rock and roll show. Um, so then uh, later on that, I got more into the devil's music, right? Uh, so, <clears throat> and I, I took piano as a kid, seven years of piano, so the core oh, of my cool. musical training, because I'm a teacher as well. Oh, right. But the, okay. Yeah, so I'm a, I'm a full-time musician. I work with kids. I've worked with a band factory at T-Rocks. I teach at Stovall. Stovall T-Rocks is different from Toronto Rock. Oh, right. <laughs> Yeah, I taught at um, T Rock's Music Academy in uh, Mississauga. I taught at uh, Degazon. I taught at uh, Silva Christian School. Anyway, so I'm a full time musician. I work with kids. I work at a band factory. Uh, things have had to slow down, obviously, because of the pandemic. But the thing is, is that um, the, the core of my training musically, from a, theor a theoretical perspective, is piano. Um, but the thing is, I. As a teenager, I got into the devil's music, and I watched The Song Remains the Same uh, one day. Uh, Led I was huge into Led Zeppelin at that time, but I didn't even pick up the guitar yet as a teenager. Then I saw that movie, and I was like, man, I gotta play. This guy, there's something magical yeah. about Jimmy Page and his, uh, his performing style and his songwriting ability and his playing itself. It's just, I think it's um, kind of otherworldly, you know? So I was hugely inspired. I started playing like that day and I haven't stopped. Wow. Um, so I got, I, I was in a band within a few months. I was a, obsessed was with guitar. Was guitar? Uh, no, I bought an Ibanez oh, uh, electric. You? That was my first guitar. I, I didn't, I couldn't afford it. I was a kid. Were you in high school? Uh, yeah, but I was, I, I was, I was a late starter with guitar. I, I, it was like 18. Cool. Yeah, but within months I had a, 
So it was like the end of That's high school. That's when I got my first base when I was 18. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. So me, I, I bought my first Ivan as it was a Road Star series. And I bought my little PV amp. I still use it for, I still have it, like a little 12 okay. watt. It's still in my room, man. Um, so, so this is the musical history of. Yeah. So like within a few months, I kind of had a little basement band and my, my parents, oh, David and Carlin Reed, I, the, the, the amount of music they had to listen to and the, the noise. <clears throat> I'm very appreciative of that. So we had a basement band and then, uh, you know, started get, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And then I was in an original band called Pin for a few years and stuff. Um, something happened to me. I'll, I'll skip over a lot of the details, but I got very sick from a, a nerve, a nervous system disorder. So what is I, this? this is, uh, I've been walking now for eight years. So the, from eight years ago and then for the previous 10 years, I couldn't walk. I was on crutches. Eight years ago? No, eight. Yeah, 18 years ago when I, uh, when I first got really sick. And again, I'm skipping over a lot of the details, but I was literally on crutches for 10 years. And actually, I have a documentary. I have a lot of footage uh, from, that, from that era, and now I'm going to come up with that later. But anyway, um, yeah, so I wasn't able to play. There was seven years within that 10-year period that I was really homebound. My parents had to take care of me. I couldn't do anything. I went down to 94 pounds, and I'm 5 foot 11. I couldn't eat. I couldn't talk. I couldn't move, you know, my foot was, I almost had my, had to get my right foot uh, amputated because there was no blood flow. It was extreme. I couldn't, I couldn't do anything. I could only sit for like 10 minutes and then I had to lie down for a half an hour, oh right? It was like that for seven years. Fortunately, I had the right people with me that I started getting the proper uh, treatment and therapies and one thing led to another. Then I had a girlfriend, Melinda, Melinda Uden. She was the original bass player for the Reed Effect. Oh. And that would have been like nine, 10 years ago. And I was still on crutches. So my first gigs, I still have on video it was me uh, sitting down because uh, oh, I gosh. couldn't walk mm -hmm. in. And then my first gig standing was at, uh, yeah, yeah. So she took that whole year off, 2011. Melinda Uden took their whole year off um, of work and then nursed me back to health. So I started walking again at Christmas of 2011. So was that like nine years ago? Anyway, uh, so after that, they built the Reed Effect and then I've had a, uh, a few members in the bands over the years. Uh, now it's just Chris and I. Um, so this would be, I, I, I recorded a solo album like nine years ago. So it's just Kirk Reed. All the, the, the Reed effect is based off that, that album. I see. And then we came out the, was with your the, brother on that one? No, just me. I played all, I, I wrote everything. all the songs and I played oh, awesome. all the instruments and everything. Except for the so drums. So that was what you did in that? Like 10 downtime. years ago. Yeah. I wrote a song in my head. I couldn't play guitar, but I whistled and wow. I, and I created like little melodies. So once I could play guitar, I was still on crutches, but I could at least move a little bit. So I put all the chords and the riffs and stuff like underneath all the songs. Yeah, like and I, I spent all those. Playing music. Yeah, but I but I wrote I and I wrote all the lyrics. So oh my God, I was I set literally seven years. I didn't touch a guitar. Wow. Yeah. So but I wrote I wrote the whole album basically in my head. Wow. Um, for the, for that period, I'm like I might as well make use of the time. Yeah. Right? yeah. So it's a 12 song EP, uh, full length full album. Length. Yeah, which I'll, I'll re I released a single called Down and we still play that live. Um, <clears throat> so I, I wrote that and that's when uh, Melinda joined. And so we started doing gigs. Uh, Jason Craig was my first uh, drummer and actually he's the lead singer of Iduna who just released the album recently as well. Yep. Great friend of mine, uh, great musician, great artist, great person. I remember sharing her video. Iduna, yeah, yep. great. Yeah, the new video that just came out uh, just like a couple months ago. Yeah. yeah, so he was the original. I still have footage. I, I should, I should re um, release that at some point of him playing our first gig. It was at uh, the Central in Kensington Market. Anyway, or sorry, Bloor and uh, Bathurst. Um, so, so yeah, I released my solo album, Kirk Reed, and then I had members. Uh, I had a drummer and Melinda, and then we wrote an album together, uh, the Reed Effect self-titled album. And that, that was recorded at DC Music uh, with Marco. Uh, then, then with uh, Brian Fontes. Hi, Marco. And, hey, Marco. Yeah, yeah, good friend of ours. We shot a video there uh, for 1973. We uh, shot a video. Only say hey when I know the person you're talking. Okay, about. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure you would. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm not surprised. I don't but yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd love to get interviews with all of them. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So Marco was. Uh, we did a. We did a our video for 1973 at DC Music, and that was before the whole lockdown. Yeah. So, but at least we got it all down. I had a bunch of uh, friends uh, that helped, so they'll be all be in the. Place. Uh, they'll all be in the video, yeah, including Veronica, because she's staying on the album, so she'll be on stage with me in the video. 
Um, so yes, yeah, so we did the self-titled album, and then like three years ago, we did a, a Strange Curiosity, our last album, and that was we we're really uh, proud of that. Brian Fontes was a part of that, and Chris, and uh, Ross Hayes, um, he helped produce, and uh, we recorded it at his studio, and that would have been about three years ago. We had our release at the Mod Club um, for Indie Week. Daryl Hurst was another uh, shout out, <laughs> and then uh, so after that. We kind of we kind of milked that for like a year, but then we started working on all these new songs, man, and we took it to the next level. We're very proud of all the stuff we've done over the last three albums, uh, but this 1973 is next level. As good as they are, um, this is the one that's good this on the this radio. this is the one that's yeah. I noticed that there's a little bit of a divergence in your influences. Like Reed Effect is maybe more grunge, and and Muddy York is maybe more rock. Yeah. If I had to pick my top three of all time, is Jimi Hendrix, uh, The Doors, Led Zeppelin. And would you say Muddy York is that? Uh, the Muddy York is a little bit more on the blues side, but even with, oh, with the... Even like an older, more traditional thing. Than that. Yeah. So tell us about your favorite places to play. I, I'd say some of the... It's a fairly small bar, but Cherry Cola is on Queen, Queen and Bathurst. Yeah, Cherish uh, is a dear friend of ours. And we played there countless times. We had Cherish. so much fun. Cherish? Yeah, she's very supportive of the yeah. community. She's hugely supportive yeah. of the music community. And the reason that that place is so cool is really uh, based on her. Like, Absolutely. She walks in like in the mid-evening just and the whole place lights up. And it, <laughs> it radiates from her and her beautiful blonde hair and just her beauty. You can't help it. Um, and she, even when more. you get to know her, she just even... Uh, even the more you get to know her, there's no disappointment. She's just a very oh, class great. act uh, a woman. She's amazing. And uh, heavily um, Cherry Colas. influential and very uh, supportive of the yeah independent music scene. I mean, she's friends with Dave Grohl, uh, Jack oh. White, um, oh, cool. Josh Homie from uh, Queens of the Stone Age. And I've seen them all there, except for Dave Grohl. And actually, we did, uh, the Muddy York played a little, um, a little gig there when Jack White came because he was playing with the Rock and Tours at a, at a concert, yeah. and he went to Cherry Cola's afterwards, and the Muddy York was playing. Yeah, I remember the story, but go ahead yeah. and tell people all about that one. <clears throat> so Cherish was kind of having a, I mean, she kept it low key at that yeah. point, so I can say it now, because this was like a year ago, or whatever, a few months ago. And, um, um, but Jack White was playing, I think, at the Sony Center with the Rock and Tours, and so she wanted it like a blues-edged kind of night. Uh, so she asked if the Muddy York could play. So yeah, we played it at, at Cherry Cola's and uh, Jack Roy White, sure enough, uh, showed up. But he, he didn't hang out in the bar too much. He went upstairs, but he could hear. At least I can say that Jack White heard the Muddy York and the members of the band too, and they hung out there for a bit. That's great. And I met Josh Homie there after the Queens. Uh, the Reed Effect wasn't playing, but I saw a Josh Homie there after um, they played the Budweiser stage. Oh yeah. And actually it's funny, we met him. Uh, another great guy. He's big. He's like six five. I don't know. He's like wow. I was a little scared when I met him. But, <laughs> uh, but anyway, Brian Fontes, who was our drummer at the time, uh, we chatted for a bit as well. Uh, so he he and Josh chatted for a minute, and he got a signature from Josh Homie on his forearm, and he got a tattoo like the next day oh, of really? his signature. So yeah, if you see Brian Fontes, look to see his forearm, and uh, he's got uh, Josh Homie's. Um, Josh Homie. It, um, from the tattoo. Queens, yeah, exactly. And that was because we were at Cherry Cola's, right? That's cool. So I, I'd say a, a lot of the good times, so many good times there, and we've done plenty of, the Reed Effect did uh, quite a few uh, double builds with Second Pass as well with Veronica. We played uh, the Bovine Sex Club, the Horseshoe, we've had a lot Bovine of great Street. times there. The Horseshoe's great. Yeah, the Horseshoe, and that's where we really play, and I'm still in touch with uh, Craig Lasky, uh, the booker of the Horseshoe. So yeah. yeah, very Queen Street rest. West. Uh, we played the Rock Pile. We opened up for Jeff Martin from the Tea Party. At the Rock Pile? At the Rock Pile, oh, yeah. that's cool, so, so that was, that was cool. Um, and we played the Silver Dollar. We opened up for Dime Mannequin. Uh, so, so Silver yeah, and we Dollar played out East. We, we've gone out East and played a, a few places that I can't, like um, Plan B in Moncton, New Brunswick. And oh, yeah. We had a lot of fun there. And also at, a, um, there's a place in uh, Charlottetown. I forgot the name of it now, but That's anyway, okay. it was a lot East of fun. East Coast Tour. East Coast Tour, yeah. <laughs> it was a lot of fun, but um, Memorable as good... As, in a way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we, we've... Yeah, a, a downtown Toronto, a lot of... We haven't yeah. played the Phoenix yet, but uh, as as oh, so as much on. fun... Yeah, as much as much fun as we've had 
uh, playing um, a lot of the bars, you know, Tattoo Rock Parlor as well. Great. Yeah. Lee's Palace. You know, we played it all. We played all the Toronto, Queen Street, Bloor Street, all that. We played the Mod Club. Uh, that's where we had our release for um, uh, for this a strange curiosity. So every place in town. Pretty. Every place in town. Well, any great. relevant place in town we played, and we had so so many gigs. But after, but we're, we're our plan, the master plan for this album, 1973, is to get onto to you know to play bigger festivals open up for bigger bands uh, play at more prestigious clubs you know play maybe the phoenix and yeah. get on a decent bill there so our our aspirations and yeah. our goals um are next level for the next year year or two perfect yeah all right so why don't you tell us uh, in all those places that you played uh, a funny story from the road oh thanks it's my breakfast <laughs> um yeah, there's a few. I like I've had countless gigs, so it's hard to keep track of all of them. Sure. I remember there was one time in my old band Pin, we uh, we had a gig in Oshawa, and it was a lot of fun. And it, we got a little crazy at the end, and then uh, my singer kind of got on, my singer got on, <laughs> fell on the floor, but he was kind of twitching and stuff, and I thought he was just really getting into it. So I was like, "Yeah, man, this is great," but it turns out he got knocked out because he fell under the speaker. Wow. And then he was kind of twitching it on the ground, but he knocked himself out. Meanwhile, I was like, yeah, all right, let's do this. Yeah. And he's like twitching. So oh, I kind okay. of felt bad after. Sorry. I still feel bad just talking about it. Yeah, so Adam Taylor, he was the singer. Oh, man. Um, how did, that, how did and, that happen? He just wiped out? Well, yeah, we were kind of moshing uh, oh. at the end. We were bumped, and then he wiped out. Wow. And then he got on the floor, and I saw him on the floor by my amp. I'm like, wow, yeah, you like what I'm doing? You want more of that? I'll give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> And then, but meanwhile, I was making him deaf while he was trying to go, you know, oh going through God. a seizure or something like that. Um, and then, yeah, and then wiping. Out. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, there was a couple of times. I know it's getting hot out here for you. Yeah, yeah. And I, I'm a whitey. I get yeah. uh, sunburned quickly. I remember there was a couple of gigs uh, where I, I really got into it again. I'm a pretty, I'm a pretty chill guy, but on stage, I'm, I get somewhat aggressive sometimes, <laughs> as you should in rock and roll. You yeah. kind of got, you kind of let, let go. Um, but there was a couple of times when I, you know, I hit the guitar strings hard, and then I, I get blood on uh, my hands, and then I, then I run into the bass player, and then he bashed me in the head. I remember there was one time there was blood, I, I cut my forehead, and there was blood going down, and I didn't know about it. People were looking at me like, looking like I'm strange. I'm like, I'm just performing. What's the big deal? And I look in the mirror, and there's blood all over my face. I didn't mean to do it. To it turned out kind of cool. But then I was in another band. And actually, it's, this is more of a cover band, um, but I'm not going to mention the singer's name because, I mean, he's, he's a nice guy, but he got too drunk before the gig, so he got on, on there, and it was two guitarists, and he, he started messing up, uh, and then he was singing the lyrics to, we're playing one song, and he's singing the lyrics to another song. It somehow worked, <laughs> but I was like, oh my God, this, yeah. So then he got kind of aggressive and drunk and messing up all over the place, but then he came over it up and slammed into my... Uh, his guitar into mine, like bang, bang, and then chipped, like chipped, Whoa. like a whole bunch of. And I still have it. Was it the I end did. of that band? Oh yeah, no, that was, no. It's <laughs> like, dude, no, come on, man. And he's like, I didn't put chips into his head. Anyway, no, no I did. Anyway, but whatever. But yeah, that was my Ibanez, and then hey, um, punk stories. Yeah, punk stories. And I remember there was one time we played at the Big Bop too, and then there was some guy, and we were a two guitar band, and some guy threw a whole pitcher of water. All over the other guitar's amp, and then he wow. crapped and killed the amp. Killed man. the amp. Yeah. Wow. So, they stuff. must have loved that band. Yeah. Yeah. No, exactly. So much they had to stop <laughs> destroy the the amp. Let's destroy the amp. Oh, there's one other time we were just going on the road. Oh yeah. Okay. Here we go. See, Wait, it's coming this back. This is a good story. Yeah. So. Wait. <clears> this <throat> is the first good story. <clears throat> yeah. So we uh, we went on tour about five years ago. Uh, so we went on tour out east, um, and our first gig was in Cornwall at Lola's, and we played there a few times. It, it was a lot of fun. <clears throat> um, so what happened, we went to my brother's place, picked up his stuff. We all, the three of us, packed into my van. Uh, then we had to, we had to reorganize uh, some of the gear because we had to pack everything proper because we had to go all the way out to Halifax, PEI, New Brunswick, and all that stuff. Anyway, we got to our Never first gig you. that night. Yeah. And then we um, we got to Lola's and I started unpacking my gear. And I realized my Marshall head, my JCM 800, which I modified, I, I showed so much love to this amp. And it's like my 
particular sound. And I still have it. I still use it. <clears throat> and it wasn't in my van. I was like, no, man, I knew I know I packed this. And then I started putting two and two together. I'm like, somebody stole my amp. And I wasn't sure what happened, but fortunately I bought a, a backup amp just in case the other one crapped out. I didn't think it was going to get stolen, but I had a trainer amp. So I used that for the tour. Um, but then I started talking to, to Chris and the, the drummer. I'm like, man, where, where did it go? Where could it possibly have gone? And then I talked to Chris and he said, no, you're, the amp was in the van when you picked me up at Bloor and Ossington. I'm like, you're right, it was. So then we figured out somebody, because we had to take all the gear out and put it on the sidewalk. Oh, yeah. And then while we were in and out, and then we were inside the van for a bit, and then, you know, but somebody picked it up while we were changing. That's the only time that it could have happened. So someone's got some balls and some, like, nuts. So I posted on Facebook the next day. I'm like, somebody stole at Bloor and Ossington uh, the, the previous day. You Within can't... a couple hours. Yeah. Um, I started getting hits because just that day, Bruce's uh, pawn shop in Kensington Market, he said they got, they get within an hour, because I, I figured the time was 3 p.m. Bruce's pawn shop. Yeah. So he, uh, um, we figured out the time because it was 3 o'clock when I picked up my brother. And so by 4, whoever stole it already went to a pawn shop to make yeah, money. Yeah. And they, they did. They, they bought it. And the thing is, it was a it was a couple. It was a guy and a woman, and they had two kids too. It was a family, so Bruce was like, you know, this has got to be a, this. You know, I don't see any reason why not to believe him. But anyway, I put it on Facebook, and then people that I didn't even know started messaging me. They said, "Dude, the amp that you just described, this modified JCM 800 Marshall, the, whatever you just described, just got posted at Bruce's pawn shop online." Um, and then I got a whole number. I'm like, dude, that's my amp. It, it, there's only one kind of that amp, but I even had a, on the back label, uh, Tom. How did it work? Tom out? McCartney was, he had his, because uh, he fixed my amp, because it was in a flood, my amp. So he brought it back to life. Oh. Anyway, that's a whole other story. Yeah. Uh, but it was, it was underwater. So anyway, he fixed it, Tom McCartney, and he put his business card on the back of the amp. So even that, proof like, that is, is yeah, this is it. He says, okay, and I so messaged the guy. Out. Yeah, I messaged uh, Bruce. And he said, clearly, this is your amp. I'm so sorry. Then the cops uh, saw the video footage. And so why is music the great communicator? Um, I think music, on, on so many different levels, uh, the, it's a great communicator. But the thing is, it, it transcends um, all languages. It predates language. Yeah. It, it, it transcends um, you know, religion, race, etc. Uh, but not only that, it also brings people together that's you know people that enjoy the same type of music and can relate and connect with uh moshing some moshing Dancing. that's a good way of yeah. uh, connecting and relating with each other through a good old-fashioned mosh um dancing you know dancing uh which is so healthy yeah. um and it's uh so you can sweat it out while you're listening to your favorite music um and so for you what are you trying to communicate in your music um I'm trying to, ultimately, through my music, I don't have any kids, as far as I know. <laughs> um, but so my songs and my music is really uh, what I'm, my legacy or whatever it's going to be. Um, so it's so important for me that, like, I, there's some rebellious lyrics and stuff like that, but ultimately it's really about inspiration, about rising up above um, negativity and uh, darkness and things like that, showing people a good time. Um, bringing some joy to people. Um, it, it, if it is, it's really understated. It's rebellion against the unfair nature of this world and uh, some of the corporate greed, of course. Yeah. I try not to get too political in my songs. Um, I have my own political views, but for the most part, I keep that to myself. And they might kind of get into the songs. So you're more just. It's more of a, like an emotional thing, just about life in general. Like yeah. there's so many unfair things. And you need, for me, I like some angry music sometimes, like Rage Against the Machine, uh, Pantera. I, I don't, I, for me, it's a release. I, I don't want to feed my anger and you well, know, I don't you know. want to turn into a bitter human being. No, but you're getting your yeah, yeah, yeah. But you're letting it out, man. That's right. And, and you can relate because you can't, you can't get through this life without trauma. And I've, you know, just like everybody, I've struggled, I've had my struggles and challenges. And music has really helped me out and continues to. Um, throughout every uh, difficulty and also to celebrate uh, life and you know when you're having a good time.
Cool. Why don't you close out with a tune and tell us how to reach out? Um, again, my name is Kirk Reed. I'm part of the Reed Effect, so thereedeffect.com. We're uh, also the Muddy York T M York. The first letter, the, the initial T B Y M. You're all over the interwebs. So we're all over the internet. There was a song that when we were with Veronica in the park, uh, one of your original songs, and the battery cut out just as you started your tune. Oh, this one? I haven't done this for a while. But... Musicians in bars getting married for your wife. Oh, thank you. Here comes Veronica. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks, Thanks for again, being man. on Musicians in Bars getting beer, Kirk Reed. Thanks. Musicians in bars getting beer.